<laughs> hey everyone, welcome to the ETH Staker uh, community call. This is the ninth call today. Our guest is Proto Lambda. Um, you'll see him on screen with uh, Buddha. Uh, so his name, their combined name today is Proto Buddha. Uh, <laughs> the ETH Staker community call is, is an attempt for uh, our community to spread information about Ethereum 2 to make staking more accessible for uh, the average user uh, and to promote solo staking as much as, it, as, as we're able to. Uh, to do that, we share information, we produce uh, these, these community calls. Uh, we have an ETH staker uh, study master where you can learn more about Ethereum too. Just a lot of ways you can get involved. Um, but yeah, let me get into this. Today we have Proto Lambda. Uh, Proto is a uh, Ethereum Foundation developer. If you've ever uh, watched the Ethereum 2 development closely, uh, you will see that Proto is kind of the, the glue or the fixer of, of all massive problems. Um, so, uh, Proto, tell us, tell us a little about, about yourself. Uh, Proto, or Didahook is my real name. Um, I just go by Proto, it's much easier online. Um, and so I just threw like kind of weird way I got into the foundation. Um, um, at first contributing open source, um, I solved many early optimization problems and I kind of just shifted to this more like this various researcher role where I'm not really researching as much as just talking to clients and uh, hacking on various different uh, projects within Ethereum 2. And um, right now, I just think I've mostly just fit in with, um, well, more testing, test networks, and maintain the attack net, and then a lot of different client issues and network uh, issues I uh, look into. Is it, is it fair? I, I think of you as of the jack of, of all trades. Is that, do you think of yourself that way or do you think of yourself differently? Yeah, so I kind of just got like, I, I'm, all over if too, like I like so many different parts and it's hard to keep your attention in one part. And there is always like, we always need more people in DevOps or in these more technical things. And so it kind of just turn out like, well, just do what is most effective at the time. And I just go try and back and forth. And so far that has been really great. I'm enjoying that a lot. So I'm gonna think of you less as a jack of all trades and more of a firefighter. You're the guy that puts out fires. That, uh, that might be fair. Yeah, that depends. Sometimes I'm the one who, who puts up the fire, and someone, I'm the one who comes and solves it. Uh, so, like, um, right now, I think towards mainnet, most clients are ready in some respects. There's just more testing, more re reviewing. I also do a lot of reviews. Um, and then it's just this kind of networking stability. Uh, where we can always more, use more people and uh, I try to do my, my part there. Can you tell us uh, where you came from? Like how, how you ended up in computer science and how you... It's a weird, it's like a very weird story. Like some of you, like I think world already knows some of this. This, I got into computer science first. Then, well, like I always liked programming, I guess. There, uh, I went to this um, technical University in the Netherlands, uh, studied computer science. Then I had this exchange program during my third year of Bachelor of Science um, in Hong Kong. And I went to hackathons and to different various things. And I ended up dropping out just to go and work at some company in Hong Kong uh, to work full time on Ethereum. And well, like, this was all planned ahead. I was thought, oh, okay. When I get back uh, to Hong Kong, I'll start working there. And in the meantime, at this open time, where I could try an experiment. I tried going to university for one more week. I thought, I have to try. I can't just pass it forever. Uh, but then again, like, I thought, I want to contribute. I want to do stuff with Ethereum. I want to go to all the conferences. There's no such thing as Corona at the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I kind of like started contributing a lot. And uh, when I was noticed, I got this big bound, uh, I got this into this bounty uh, where you would program the full specification at the time, 
it wasn't really also evolved uh, into like a thousand lines of code. It's just like a code golf challenge to mm -hmm. get it, slim it down and look at the code. Like you'd have to know what's going on to try and actually do this kind of thing. And then that all went really well. And then there was this conference in uh, Paris, ECC, very first, no, the, the second edition. Um, and I got to meet some of the Ethereum 2 researchers. And from there, it got really started. And I wasn't even in Hong Kong yet. But then uh, I uh, went to Hong Kong, was lucky enough to meet other researchers there as well. And then it was just like, I only Eve 2, Eve 2 every day, talking, discussing, and writing tests and stuff online. And then, like, just a few weeks into my first job, I was hired for the foundation and stuff. I, uh, it was kind of messy to make that switch, but in the end, I think it worked really well. And I left some good smart contracts there as well. So, uh, but now it's protocol all the time. No smart contracts anymore. Why didn't you care Exciting. about Ethereum well, Why didn't right. you care about Ethereum 1, actually, and just Ethereum 2? So, OK, what got me started with Ethereum 1? Well, I was just every briefly into Bitcoin first. Didn't know anything about community or like what the goals are or anything. I thought, well, this is kind of makes sense to have money for yourselves. Uh, it's very technical, fitting with cryptography. Okay, I, I want to be in this. And then I got more involved with meetups. And so during the run up in 2017, it started with just a little bit about Bitcoin, then Ethereum, then more and more meetups. And by the end of the year, I was going to one or two meetups every week. And then uh, co organizing some meetups. And then unfortunately later, it crashed, right? There was this dip. Um, meetups went down, but I kept going. I, I liked Ethereum. I learned a lot about Solidity, the EVM, the yellow paper, all that. Uh, and so I kind of just got stuck in Ethereum and never left, I guess. <laughs> okay. I'm enjoying it so far. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I love to hear the different routes that people get or the, that people follow to get into the space. Um, it seems like, and I guess this is obvious, there's either the programmer route or the investor route, um, and they eventually find their way to being contributors. Uh, cool. Right, I think for programmers, it's really interesting and helpful. If they, like for me, I first did this open source work, I did this bounty, we have bounties up right now. Like anyone who likes to get into the space, I really encourage to just look at what's there and try and sh say hello online. Because hiring is, for us, it's really difficult, uh, but it, it's it's helpful when you just show your, yourselves. Yeah, I, f I found the same thing that at, at first there are so many people talking that all of the voices are drowned out. But if you're persistent and you continue working on the thing you're working on, eventually you you become more recognized in the community. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely follow that. Uh, we have some really interesting questions here. Um, before <laughs> I get into those questions, yeah, they're, they're all secret. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we, we have a published agenda. Um, but I, I want to talk about, uh, I feel like this is an advertisement. Let me say, be very clear. Uh, ETH Staker is friends with POAP, but we're not, I wouldn't say we're sponsored by POAP. Uh, rather than that, uh, we're just sort of obsessed with the idea. I'm obsessed with the idea of POAPs. And I know a lot of other people like them too. Uh, because every time I speak about it, I sound like I'm doing a commercial. Uh, that's actually my excitement. It's not uh, Patricio giving me all of his Uniswap tokens. <laughs> Superfizz.eth. Uh, <laughs> um, so POAPs are an ERC-721 token. They're a non-fungible token, and they represent uh, attendance uh, or participation in some kind of event. POAP stands for Proof of Attendance Protocol. Uh, Patricio is the guy behind it. Uh, and I'm talking about it now because you can get a POAP for attending this meeting. Pretty much everyone who's here has, has been through this before. But for the benefit of anyone who's watching this later, if you watch our meetings live, if you participate in our events live, you can... Uh, get a link that will allow you to go to a site, poep.xyz or wherever it is, and you'll be able to claim that uh, NFT token to keep it in your wallet. Now, the neat thing is when you go to several events, you end up with a 
collection of these POAPs that, uh, I don't want to say they give you credibility, but they identify you as far as what your interests are and what you're participating in. There's a very good chance that as, as POAP develops and continues on, that reputation will be more meaningful and more useful to the community uh, as far as like getting entrance into events. Um, hey, look at that. What do you, I do Tacona, have so Topaz, Depp, what's the ConCon? Con? Non -con. Non -con. I think Lamps and Molly, let's, let's look at there. Ah, uh, so, uh, <laughs> no, I, I like that a lot. I don't have that many. So, um, yeah, the, the poets are just a really neat thing. As an aside, you can also, if you choose to, you can sell them. Um, I've seen them on OpenSea.io. Um, I don't encourage you to sell them because I think that they're more meaningful as, as a demonstration of who you are, but there's nothing preventing you if you choose to sell them. And I would encourage you to sell them for nothing less than a thousand ETH a piece. Uh, yeah, 33 uh, yeah. <laughs> So there's something, there's something else about POAP on, on this event, which um, it's worth celebrating. On, on every event, we have issued POAPs. And when I say we, it's not only ETH takers, but every other event that had POAP, and there were hundreds of them. The pitch was always, these POAPs are going to be useful for something someday. They won't be like they are now, which is like Bitcoin, something to look at and not being able to do anything else. For the first time now, if you get this POAP, you get the ability to vote on the POAP design of the Bitcoin chain launch. And because the submission with the most votes is awarded a thousand dollar bounty, it may happen that someone is willing to bribe you for accurate votes. So, so there's an angle that really <laughs> justifies getting this power. Uh, unfortunately, um, gas prices right now are almost at the teraway value. Uh, we shouldn't measure them in gigaway anymore because they are almost over a thousand gigaway units. So my advice is to not uh, claim them right away. You just input your ENS or address on the field, click claim, and you're done. Because if you get to claim it on mainnet, it may end up costing like 20 or $40, which is insane. And on, on a couple of weeks, hopefully, we should be minting POAPs on, on the XDAI network, at least temporarily, and, and it should be free to do so. So, so make sure you put your address on the, on the field and you click claim, um, but, but don't bother claiming it actually. So that's it for me. And that's something that took me a while to catch. Um, if you go to, if you go to the, the claim site, you can enter and press claim, just like Patricio said, you do not have to complete the transaction. Your, your address will be stored in the database. And after, when XDI goes live, which I believe it's very close now, uh, maybe in a few weeks, because your address has been associated with that PO app in the database, but you didn't claim it, um, it will be sent to you automatically, which is something that I guess, even as an organizer, I was sort of aware of, but it, it didn't really click with me till a, a few days ago. Um, and I, I don't want to speak for Patricio, but I know his heart. <laughs> when he says that someone might uh, bribe you to influence you, we're not, we're not encouraging you to accept bribes. We're saying that the potential exists and, and POAP isn't in anyone's control. So what you do with it is completely up to you. Uh, is that fair? That's correct. Great. And I, I'm happy that East Staker is so closely associated with POAP because I believe it is going to, I believe POAP will be a huge part of our future uh, in terms of uh, building reputation and a trustless system. So uh, I look forward to that potential. Um, Proto. <laughs> hey, buddy. Uh, so some, some of the questions that I thought were really great. What do you think about, what do you think we're going to expect from Adasha in the next couple of weeks before mainnet launches? Anything exciting? All right. So it's this run up to mainnet now. And like, for mainnet, we want to get a lot of things right, and including some updates. 
So it's now this balance between do we test them on different test nets or are we going to risk it on Medasha and test the full blown life? And so this is kind of exciting for the developers and for users. I think it's really just like this final plan you have on a large scale network to prepare, uh, get involved, try running validators. Comes at Noco, you can even try Lodestar. Like there's no, like, no, no point in not trying. Like run it, try it. Um, I think that's, that's what I like now about Medasha. Meanwhile, we have attack nuts. Um, and compared to Medasha, I think it's like, if you're more into it just for messing with the attack nuts and trying stuff, you can get rewarded and you just go to the attack nuts. Um, so check that out as well. Where are the attack nuts hosted? Um, so, hey, looks there. <laughs> Um, right, so at TechNets, also there's this other challenge, uh, the Medosha data challenge, which I also wanted to talk about. Um, so, like most of these challenges, you can find in the Eastaker Discord or in the if 2 RD Discord, where you can find people talking about this, working on these things, and you can earn bounties for the TechNets. Oh, they're muted. muted. No, yeah. yeah, it's fine now. <laughs> okay. La Lamboshi, can you mute yourself? Because... Yeah. All right, so I was talking about this. Um, we have Medasha, we have the nuts. Um, in Eve Staker Discord, Eve R&D Discord, you can find a lot of help. And then for the less technical and client uh, folks, the data challenge is still really interesting. Like you, you should know some coding, but maybe Excel does as well. What we're looking for is these new insights, taking Explorer data, API data, and take a look at what can be done to improve the main, to improve the testnet and uh, polish this more towards mainnet. One of the interesting things I've learned about uh, the Madasha data challenge, we had uh, Lakshman and Steven on our last call, um, is that a lot of the people who would do really well may not really know a lot about Ethereum yet. Uh, and so if, if you're watching this call and you know someone who's a data scientist or who's interested in data modeling, uh, it would be a great idea to connect them. I know now that there's a, uh, there's a couple zip files that are circulating just with uh, attestation data um, and just data right from uh, the ETH2 clients. Uh, one of my good friends who, who wasn't really familiar with ETH is now picking through that and creating some really awesome stuff. And the cross pollination is that he's going to be eligible to win uh, a, a, an award and he's investing in the Ethereum community. So he's becoming more familiar with Ethereum. He's more likely to engage the community and we're benefiting from what he's providing. So uh, it's just a, an awesome opportunity. Um, cool. Um, there's a lot of, so security is, is one of the big, uh, the big bears in the room. And, and I know a lot of us, a lot of us who have been a while, don't been around a while, don't worry too much about security. Like we secure it and forget it. Um, I know that's probably not a good, a good theory, but we secure it and, and monitor it. Uh, but in terms of, of DDoS and using VPNs, do you have thoughts or best practices for running client validators? All right. So there's this endless discussion about what is the, which is about the best hardware. And um, what I can really like advise you with is try and manage your risk. Uh, think about setup. There are lots of great write-ups being made. And I think like just as with the data challenge, if you're motivated, is this, if this is your thing, uh, you would even want to help you uh, provide these things to the community uh, as a service to others. And then just direct advice for myself is I think the minimal thing that you should be doing as like the pure hobbyist staker is use some kind of VPN or have some way to be reachable from some other point. I said like worst comes to worst, uh, you have some home issue or there's uh, some targeted DOS would be like absolute worst, unlikely, but like possible. Um, in this case, it's just rather easy to afford and probably like the cheapest solution you could get to
to keep staking and have less worries. Uh, you said you said have access to a VPN, and I I know that there are you know there are two major implementations of VPN. There is uh, VPNing VPNing out to a service to obfuscate your location, and then there's VPNing into your home service as a as a way of securing against SSH exploits. Mm -hmm. And definitely talking about the uh, former, like obscuring your your identity is what it's all about. So okay. if you does this thing where they separate the user layer, all the identity stuff, your validators from your network identity. So if you're validating with your validator, nobody knows it's you on on this certain node. If they try to mine really hard, it's also this the data challenge. Uh, privacy is this point of interest where every Thing that leaks privacy, we, should, we will look deeper into. We're really, really trying to polish clients to hide uh, as best as they can what's running and like avoid this kind of targeting. It's like there's so many validators. The, the problem is not being DOS. The problem is being is is targeted DOS. Where at the right time, just at the point where you think you need to propose a block, that it then then have a break slow. And then you have this problem propagating a block on the network. If you could avoid this with some VPN, you're ways ahead of most others. Okay. Nolan, do you? So, I, I, I was. I'm always curious about your perspective on these security measures. Have you thought about running your node through a VPN? Um, Are you there, Nolan? Yeah, I, I was thinking about having one, like run it on my IP, and then if I need to can flip it over to the VPN. And if I start ah. getting attacked there, you can go to a different IP forth. through that VPN. That was sort of my plan. That's a great idea. Cause I, as Proto was talking about it, I'm like, I, I really don't like some of the overhead that, that comes along with running a VPN full time, but running it as, as a, as a backup. A safety net. Yeah. But, and he's also talking about like, like being targeted if 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 we're staking from our our local ip it it does that so that argument is you know if someone knows your ip they've got you but ips are kind of transient you can pretty easily spoof your mac or reset your address um and people have been public have, have been broadcasting ips since 2010 since 2009 when bitcoin launched like those are those are pretty much home or office IPs. Don't you agree, Proto? So it depends. So if staking, it's, and especially if two, it's about timing. So like persisting this kind of attack is just ridiculous, especially to like a small home hobbyist who doesn't have that much to worry about. It's not going to happen to everyone. Uh, but then like timing, and it's just this short amount of period where you know it gets a little bit of extra stress, that can be annoying. So these kind of security measures are, where you know, have this network solution, it makes more and more sense, the more validators you run. It's not the primary thing to worry about. But for security also, like just separating out your validator, being like conscious about like how you like move around your keys, uh, thinking about uh, having a backup of your, uh, uh, of your nodes and being able to uh, move around the information of your validator, this protection information, so that if you switch to a different mode, you're right ready from the get go to start validating again. These kind of things, they're also like, I think for a home hobbyist, someone who's running one or two validators, is more critical to get right than the, the networking. Okay, interesting. Michael, I know you, you have interest in uh, network topology. Do you have? Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, this is where I'm a little out of my depths, in fact. Um, so I, I did have our current topology right now is we have like a load balancer in front of our validator. So I, I had questions in regards to when you start running multiple instances. So I don't think it's really an issue when we have a single validator, but I was curious how you can, because the logic being if I'm going to run a validator or multiple validators, I want to, as best possible, mitigate any single point of failure. 
So that being power and internet uh, from the physical layer, right? So I want to, we've got multiple WAN connections from different I ISPs that are coming into a load balancer. And that's just to mitigate the, you know, give us a, a form of redundancy. But how does that in relation to the validators with upping the probability of being slashed because of how those load balancer work? So I guess the ultimate question here is, how do we solve for internet redundancies without the potential of being slashed or playing by the rules, but potentially looking like, like we're not sort of thing? Or a home hobbyist, like that's the very minimal setup where you just have one validator, one beacon mouth. That's like as minimal as you can go. But then from there, there's like ways to improve on this, right? Load balancing, being able to attach your validator to different beacon nodes, that's one way. Um, then, it, especially if these are remote beacon nodes, then you're able to at least have true one beacon node to perform your duties. Um, so this, this is thing, if you run many validators, you could look into. Um, then there are remote signer applications. It's not just the validator you're running. It's a, you take a remote signer where your keys are hosted. So you have your keys isolated. And then that application talks to validators and those talk to beacon mods. So it would be like the even more complete setup, something more closer to what like a you know, staking service or like a bigger uh, staker would run. I, I feel like it's a lot more expensive to rent or borrow or buy or use your bot to DDoS than, it, than the actual return you would get anyway. So, I, I mean, assuming, let's say I, I have 10 validators, it seems like whoever is DDoSing me is spending more to DOS me than I would be making anyway. So, I, I guess I know some DOSs can last days, weeks, or days or weeks. But it seems like uh, just based on economics that the validators are in a superior position. Is that? Oh, kind of. So I wouldn't <laughs> even estimate things. What I started off with is to think about risk management. As a single staker, if I go offline, what happens? Right? And then what would you want to do is move your keys, uh, get online again somewhere. Like by no means there's something like there's no there shouldn't be any drama there. It's just like you can be prepared for this, um, and exactly there's a certain cost to attacking someone, and if that doesn't outweigh like the cost of moving to some other different host, there's no point in, in worrying too much about it. What you should be doing is think about your key management, uh, think about just general security, so not kind of dos dos factor, but more like uh, being able uh, to protect yourself from some kind of intruder or not have your home network right, uh, right in the open. Yes. Like the, uh, that's important. Your, your words make me think that one of the things that we could develop as a community is an organized list of priorities because I, I find that there's people keep bringing up error correcting RAM. And I'm like, error correcting RAM is like the lowest worry of a priority of anything you could be thinking about. But for them at that moment, because it's on their mind, it is like the most important thing. I, it might be good for us to develop a, a rank of prioritization so that we can say, well, that's really below this. And if you've taken care of the 37 things that are above it, then definitely look at this. But otherwise, because I, I do think DOS is, is likely to happen, but I, I'm also, as you know, kind of experienced in the sector, I'm not really worried about it because it's it's not that high on the on the priority list for me right now. Right, it'd be more of a worry if it happened to anyone, like like everyone at the same time. That's a serious protocol issue. Whereas yep. if it's a small point of failure, or like or sorry, I should say, just a single node that has goes down, but the rest of the network marches on without noticing, it's manageable. You can manage the risk and. Attack costs are high, but stakers should be able to move and protect themselves. So, that like, kind of gets me to uh, the hardware. I'm sorry. 
Wait, yeah. Did I cut you off? I'm sorry, your audio cut out. Um, so I, I'll, I'll go on. Did you, did you have something to? Can, well, can I add something just real quick? Please. Yeah. And, Please. Um, what do you think about doing multiple deposits in one transaction? Does it kind of reveal your identity as well? So if someone does 100 deposits? So, yeah, so you can take some precautions on this user layer where you make transactions or you put some graffiti in your validator or blocks, these kind of things, or you're on if 2 stats. During the test nodes, there are lots of fun and nobody cares. During mainnet, you should be looking through this critically and thinking like, okay, is it more obvious that I'm running these validators? Uh, am I exposing myself in some way? And if you're not prepared to, to be identified or have, have feel that, then you should try and minimize it as much as possible and have like a plan for what if A, then B, don't go unprepared into staking. So also, um, what about doing, is it more, is it smarter to do uh, one deposit per ETH1 address or? Yeah, that's doing... just one example. So okay. the deposits are one of these more privacy problematic things. Or if you're just making reuse in the same Ethereum one address while you're the deposits and making them shortly after one another, then it's kind of obvious that you're the same person. <laughs> and especially when you're when you're running on the same node, it gets even more obvious. Like all these correlations, this thing that's just likely to be the same person, the same machine, uh, it just makes the life of some data analysis trying to look for these few attackers for these few validators easier. And this making the lives of some potential attacker who needs this data also easier. Yeah, talking about deposits, doesn't the launchpad do all the, all the deposits at once? Or yeah, is a, there some scheduling behind it now? It's not the biggest concern, but they should definitely do this better. Okay. And then again, it's like not a perfect solution either to do them purely randomly. And there's also just some, like, again, if you can manage that people think of it as the same person, maybe okay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, try try and do these things uh, without like exposing yourself like you do right now. And test nuts, are, it's just it's just not the same. Uh, I think given it's not with phase zero, like with being just going into staking first. And then adding these other functionalities on top later. It's just good risk management to not have this. If anything, you, you keep Ethereum 1 like, running stable and move into ETH2. You have this ERP, and that was just uh, progress. Maybe we should talk about this as well. So, uh, but before that, I was thinking it would be a neat. Uh, a neat feature request for tornado.cash to accept 32 ETH as an increment so that people could easily, or maybe it would be like 32 and a half, but you know, cause it goes from 10 to hundred and it would be neat for validators to be able to swap identities effectively with tornado.cash. So this, this idea has been tossed around for a bunch of times in the, during the Eve Denver hackathon. I think it was named Kettlecore or something like that, where they uh, implemented the user interface for tornado cash to do 32 ETH deposits, um, it, it kind of makes sense to, to at least think about your privacy on Ethereum 1. And then Tornado is one of those obvious uh, answers. Uh, you were interested in talking about an EIP? Right. So did you see the EIP? There's a draft up. There's, it's not oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it will be, be like lots of suggestions, people nitpicking every little detail, but it's happening. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's hard because each of these little bitty incremental, like Madasha being released and uh, planning uh, Spadina, like, and, you know, the official EIP for ETH2, it, it all uh, adds to the excitement and the potential that it's, it's actually happening. It, it feels, it really seems, and I, I'm not asking you or anyone to make a, an assumption, but it feels like it's going to happen in November. Like I, I feel like we're we're on track for it. So very exciting. Why are you laughing, Buddha? 
<laughs> that was one of the questions we expected, or I expected at least. Questions? <laughs> I can't give that. Oh no, no. I, I, and let's be clear. I'm not asking. I don't. I, I don't. I'm. I'm watching the same things everyone else is. What I'm suggesting is that all of these pieces are coming together, um, and it does a. I didn't ask. I can't thump you on the screen. It didn't. All right. I'm off. Well, you, you could ask instead what are the next steps, bro, to right, after the so, EIP. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, first, we'll finish the EIP. Like, there's a lot to do and to merge, and it's not quite done yet. Uh, good comments in the EIP. It's worth the discussion, definitely. Um, then from there, it's a mix of coordination between client teams. They know need to like say they're ready. You need to think about Spadina, Spadina. Um, it's worse than Medasha for me. I think this name is <laughs> difficult. Um, then um, from there, um, the deposit contract, of course, we'll try and enshrine the, the contract address and will never be forgotten from there. So. We'll it will, it will go into the EIP for sure. Then I think it's also just this, this social effort, definitely where you, where you all can help and everyone else to get this thing off the ground and ready for mainnet launch. Um, and then more feedback, more test net testing, and then uh, prepare. It's, you know, it's gonna be like one exciting few months yeah. to do uh, us the launch. I, I really see eStaker our role as promoting those individual stakers, the people with 32 ETH who might otherwise have sent their deposit to a staking as a service host or to an exchange. Um, and so as far as like getting this information out to people who aren't in this, in the core of things, but just making sure that everyone has a, a general idea how to get involved with the test nets and, uh, and be at mainnet launch. So yeah, great. Um, I can add um, another. Do you have something? All right. So I think before the first test net, Danny was asking about how many clients we would need or how long we could run yeah. for. I think it was three clients for two months. Yeah. So in my opinion here is it go likely the three and a half, right? So Deku, in my opinion, is quite ready. Um, pretty solid in review. Uh, Prismatic, there's so many users still, like even if where they can be like ups and downs. I think they'll be more than ready. Uh, Lytos is very solid as well. Um, like I think just the three clients, all we need is like more uniform distribution of users. The better this one third split is, the less risk the network has. And still like this, this network is built around this two thirds assumption where with two thirds, it can have finality and it can be very healthy as a network. That's great. So if there's one client that can go down, it will be on the, on the edge, right? That's just one more client, things get even better, like much, much better. Where if one client goes down, you can manage if you have good participation. And definitely count good participation with mainnet compared to Medusha. It's about real stake with like real high stake. It's just different from running a testing machine. Are you aware of any efforts to encourage so you know we had this this client uh Madela, madasha client poap challenge are you aware of any current efforts to uh encourage people to use clients other than prism it, it's it's a problem everybody's aware of but are we are we doing anything or just encouraging so uh, like the both thing uh, for to encourage people to run different clients has been great I'm looking forward to the results, but I was already hinting at uh, this time period, roughly being, I think, the 300,000 uh, slot mark was the official end. And then I can't wait to, to see these tokens being distributed. And like, it's, it's kind of exciting to have these, these batch of testnet users and maybe based on their tokens, heard their feedback or their motivation for Genesis. Um, like this, this will be an interesting time for sure. With, like how how these kind of testnet users move towards mainnet and uh, how, how it will go if um, voices will hear, uh, what kind of new setups we'll see, uh, news, uh, the explorer is improving and showing these more mainnet thing, focused things. 
uh, and we'll be crawling the network to try and uh, have a better look at uh, client diversity. Yeah. Do, do you feel like I do that, and I, this, you sort of alluded to this, that the top three clients are rather interchangeable? Uh, Lighthouse, Nimbus, and Teku? Uh, that's not what I said. Lighthouse, Prismatic, and Teku, that they are fairly uh, at the same, or personally, I don't think they're at the same level of development, but I think that they're in, more or less interchangeable. Is that fair? I would say interchangeable is a bad word. I like them for all of their own features. Mm -hmm. Definitely things reasons one would choose one or the other based on their situation. Uh, but then again, yeah, there there should be already enough if you provide sufficient resources, uh, know how to run your clients, and you're good to go. Um, and then the other clients, they're pretty far. I would say Nimbus definitely is like a party. I would say three and a half. Or, um, I think they can do it. They can be at Genesis. But then again, they yeah, went through a very rough uh, roadmap to get Nimbus off the ground. And uh, with lib P2P, there's a whole new networking stack. There's lots of lower level changes in the firm too that are very challenging. And they had a harder time with um, because they're, they're doing things so differently, right? There's different programming language, uh, a whole new team uh, in the space. With like, uh, whereas compared to Prism, not been running test nets for so long. It's uh, definitely uh, like it's a contender. It's not the maybe not the very first thing you would think of for uh, Genesis. Yeah. Okay. I have um, one more, maybe. <laughs> so with Asha, we had five clients. Uh, how many clients do we want or expect on the mainnet? Do we want to have all of them ready or just two or just three? Um, I think like even two could work, preferably three. I definitely think we can do three this stage. And, uh, and four is not shooting for like four. We can do that. I definitely support that at first. And then again, we should try, we should risk, manage your risks and think about security. Uh, think about reviews, there will be audits published uh, soon. Um, these kind of things. There's, uh, it's not just about the first but also just like uh, there are some sanity checks you should do and think reason through running all these all these clients. And that may be a good fill of, fill offer to have, uh, for example, uh, to have some diversity. Um, and then again, think about which clients you'll be on the run and uh, how that works for you. Yeah. I've one. I've actually two more questions. Looking into the future, um, now that with the we have one way of transitioning to Ethereum 2 by depositing into the contract. Um, let's assume that not everyone is going to be a validator on Ethereum 2. How is the, the Ether from Eve 1 going to transition to Eve 2 without being a validator? Is there going to be some kind of contract where you just deposit into and have the balance available on your... Yeah, it's uh, um, the economic activity from the very get-go is Lots of different risks and problems. I'm definitely supportive of it. And I think there will be happening something uh, during phase zero. Um, and then again, like it makes sense to start it and with just the minimal set and scale up the features rather than try and throw more complexity at the problem. But is there, but is there a specific idea how to so move that ether? We are different ideas. The bridge is definitely still possible. And the slow bridge, especially, is relatively easy to implement. Uh, well, it is about like high stakes. It can be implemented where like the very basic solution would be to have like a two week period um, only for uh, one with some kind of voting to the sites on the uh, Ethereum 2 chain, uh, similar to how the Ethereum 2 chain decides on the Ethereum 1 chain. Um, and then we'll essentially have a slow to way bridge is one option, it's just speculation. Um, <coughs> there's this demo of Ethereum uh, 1.5 with uh, Teku uh, integrating uh, Go Ethereum. So what happens here is that in Kotlin, there is this uh, uh, shard block processing and the actual contents of the block are processed on Go Ethereum nodes, it's delegated 
Um, and that's also just very interesting to actually see end to end a transaction go to Ethereum 2. I don't think it's, it's necessarily far off to just think about the complete picture. Um, if that's if that roadmap is fast enough, it's not if that's possible, I'd much prefer that uh, for these workarounds like bridges. Yeah, and I think many people also think that since phase zero took so long that the other phases will take as long as well. So what do you think about the uh, the time between phase zero and one and one to one one five? So, yeah, I'm personally I'm bullish there, I guess. Like the complexity there's still a lot of complexity. And what phase zero solved is this uh, networking and database uh, parts of the clients, which are very, very complicated to move the complete networking stack, the concept all these attestations. There's, uh, there's this solution is designed to aggregate attestations, uh, propagate aggregates. This on a network level, it's a huge step. And it's just that users don't really see as much of this. And then, for example, there are this committee ma management subnets, they're already there. There's just no, no data to vote on these subnets, but they do exist. And this, this structure is definitely in place for phase one uh, to make quicker progress from there. Um, so yes, I'm positive there that we can improve <laughs> and not take longer than phase zero at least. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid it would be confidence killing if it took as long as phase zero. Uh, but it is, it's kind of nice to see L2 is stepping up. So maybe, uh, maybe the pressure on L2 to step up is, is okay and, and things are going to, to balance out. I don't think that we would have had as many layer two solutions if Beacon Chain had been launched before now because everyone would see uh, the potential of sharding and, and lay off of L2. Um, one thing that I wanted to catch before we finished was hardware. Um, I, I think you run, well, if you want to tell us what you run, but a lot of people are curious and we talked a little bit about the network stack, but in terms of client stack, what, what do you think are minimum average and best in, Right, so it's complicated. So, um, generally, I live pretty lightweight, so I don't have expensive home hardware. Uh, what I do manage is like lots of different nodes on Medusha for testing, for the dev nuts, for the attack nuts, where it's, it's as a researcher, it's more complicated to just keep up with all the DevOps. Uh, but I think my experience so far that for the best net scale, that's uh, not the largest as Madasha. With, uh, it's, I think we're now at 55 validators in the registry. That's a lot already. I think it's advisable, like, it's a good idea to have like, a 4 gigabyte RAM kind of setup uh, with at least two, if not four, cores. That seems like a reasonable pick for me, like, conveniently running the beacon out. And my nodes are actually running on lower specs on the current attack net and on the current Malaysia network. Now, for some clients, it works well enough. Prism and Lighthouse they can do it, although you're really just pushing the limits there. So just be, like have some room, let's say four gigabytes for maybe more, more, like eight gigabytes for Prism, for Teku especially, it's a good decision to go beyond that. Um, but four gigabyte assumes that we have no finality issues, right? Right. So, like, where when there are finality issues, you have this problem where there's these different choices in the fork chain, where the client needs to deal with more data that can't be persistent to the disk, or that needs to be in memory to be able to switch more quickly. These kind of things, they're, they hold memory, and need times. There's so with larger test nets. And with finality, bigger nodes definitely helps. And also, running an each one node requires way more than four. Like eight, eight gigabytes is like eight gigabytes the limit. Is, yeah. <laughs> I would say I recommend eight gigabytes, especially just for Genesis and say stability for trying to optimize costs. Which, 
see more optimizations actually. So we're working on, on we have been optimizing state transitions a lot. I've been working on that on our side. And then it's uh, more so more so optimizing sync speed and database uh, size. I think we'll get there and we get the goal of running with our resources eventually. Maybe that's the last question. I don't know if you have something else, but no, I, I was actually looking to let's, open it up to anybody else who wanted to. Uh... Let's imagine the worst case scenario. <laughs> we keep staking for two years. Everyone is happy. And then we try our withdrawal keys and they don't work. Oh, yeah, um, it's just like nightmare material right there. But is there any uh, solution that's, I don't know. Like... I think definitely before Genesis, there's this withdrawal methods channel in the Ethereum R&D. Uh, in the East Staker Discord probe out of the topic discussion. I think it's it's good to talk about this kind of thing through the community. And like, kind of this problem here is that you want to design it really, really well, this kind of withdrawal. The current withdrawal method, it should work. It's really simple. It's just not like integrated with Ethereum 1 as, as well. It just wants to withdraw in Ethereum 2, which like we're right now we're just awaiting phase one and phase two make that really like, effective. Um, I think maybe we'll deploy some kind of test suit for this. Um, I think it's definitely worth it. But then, again, right now, not the priority. Before, before launch, definitely. Yeah. definitely if, if, if we take the route we have right now and let's say we launch and everything is fine, would we need to fork to do some, some forking on the EVE2 chain in order to make the funds accessible? Or is it? Yeah, so I expect that if we're going to fork EVE2 chain regardless, and we'll definitely include things like this, where we process withdrawals or any similar things. All right. Yeah, okay. I think that's the biggest concern. <laughs> yeah, I. And, okay, so if, say, we launch EVE2 and it all breaks or say we have like a, a big finalization issue like we saw on Madasha, would that be something we just power through or would we relaunch using the same deposit contract? I think it was unfortunate with Madasha that we powered through. Uh, clients harder to build, they've improved there. It's hard to imagine like things going like that again. And even if they do, like we put Stormer out of this, we'll power through it more quickly. And then worst case of the worst, it could be a restart. And then, yeah, like if little economic activity from the start, um, good coordination and like expectations, setting expectations from the start, if, I think like, like worst case is still, it's not a black swan event either. One of my favorite new questions I've just been thinking about for a while. What is the thing that you're interested in talking about or that you think about that we haven't really breached today? What's whether even if it's not ETH2 related, like what is what are you obsessed with right now? Um, well, right. So I think like right now I'm staying here in Vienna with uh, the Chain Explorer team, um, which is a lot of fun. I'm getting more and more interested in all this kind of data about uh, testnets and crawling, finding more people on the DevOps. And people are, are kind of interested in helping find these issues in testnets. So open call to anyone that kind of like wants to get into this. Uh, we're out here, we'd love to have, talk to you. Uh, the data, the data challenge is like, one way to get started, uh, but then if you're interested more in networking or anything else, there may be some spots or something uh, interesting for you. Uh, yeah, I think we, we're not talking enough about kind of like growing this ecosystem of tooling uh, and of information to support all these new features for the big chain explorer that we've been um, It's kind of important just before launch to get this all sorted and improve. Awesome. So yeah, I guess that is the closing. Like we talked about, we run these calls to onboard people to give them more exposure to the Ethereum ecosystem and especially ETH2. Um, and so that 
the Madasha ch data challenge is a tremendous opportunity. Um, coming into the forums to learn more about how things work. Uh, one of the, the best ways that I found is just creating a little bit of your own content, like looking for something interesting that you don't understand and exploring it for a while and then producing a, a text post or a video or a podcast about, hey, this is the thing that I didn't get and I'd like to tell other people what I figured out. Um, so yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming today to help us all uh, hear your perspective. I'm, I'm always so impressed with uh, the quality of your work and your solutions. Uh, so you're, you're one of the people I admire in the space. So uh, it's great to be able to talk to you. Cool. Yeah, I really appreciate like I'm not as active in the chat in Leafstaker. I definitely learned a lot and watched these calls. It's uh, been great. I uh, appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Great. Uh, and thanks everyone for coming. Don't forget to claim your POAP. Um, actually, don't forget to go and enter your ETH1 address so when XDI scaling goes live in a few weeks, you can get your POAP delivered for free. Um, and I think it's time to go check on the price of Uniswap. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, You're everybody, for shopping. coming out. Thanks, Proto. Wait, thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye.